Welcome to Season 3 of Inflammation Nation. My name is Gronia O'Leary. Inflammation Nation is a podcast from Arthritis Ireland aimed at increasing awareness and understanding of arthritis and related conditions. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Helen French to the podcast series. Helen is an Associate Professor in the Royal College of Surgeons School of Physiotherapy and a Clinical Specialist Physiotherapist. You're very welcome, Helen. As we know, osteoarthritis contributes to considerable physical and psychosocial burden, often resulting in you know, significant pain and physical disability for many people who live with it. It's also very prevalent in Ireland, so we're, we're, you know, we're really delighted to have you here today to discuss the role that exercise plays as a first line treatment for osteoarthritis. So I'm going to start by asking you to first explain what exactly osteoarthritis is. Yeah, thanks, Grania, and I'm delighted to be here. So osteoarthritis is, as you said, it's the most common type of arthritis. And whilst a lot of your listeners may be familiar with the idea of an inflammatory arthritis, we don't categorise osteoarthritis as an inflammatory arthritis. It's a condition that affects the joint, but it affects particularly the cartilage of the joint and really the ability of the cartilage to repair itself. Now, sometimes people would have heard the term it's a wear and tear arthritis, This is not a very helpful term to use because that implies that the joint wears out and that's not always the case. So really, we're trying to move away from using that description of it being a wear and tear arthritis. It does affect the joint. It causes pain. And then because of that, it does have an impact on other structures around the joint, for example, the muscles. So if someone has pain, they're going to start uh, doing less movement and less exercise, which, of course, is what I'm going to talk about today. And then that starts to affect the muscle strength around the joint, which is really important for joint function. So there's also this perception that osteoarthritis is inevitable. Like we we see it in our work every day, um, you know, and that it's an inevitable part of the aging process. What, What do you say about that? Yes, we do know that it is associated with getting older. So age is a risk factor and there are lots of other risk factors. But we can't assume that every single person who gets who who gets gets arthritis as they get older, because that's not the case. And we I mean, a a really good example is when people present, you know, with pain in one knee. And, you know, it's, they've got arthritis in one knee. Well, I would say, well, actually, you know, your, your two knees are the same age. So why do you have it in one knee mm. and not the other knee? And that would apply to lots of joints. So it is not an inevitable consequence of getting older. However, the prevalence or the, the frequency of it does increase with age. So we do know that age is a risk factor. And do we know then more about why some people, you know, if you take two 80 year olds, for example, one with no arthritis, the other with significant osteoarthritis. Do we know why? Why well, that is? Yeah, we know we know what risk factors are there and there possibly are more risk factors we don't know about. And I, I suppose the other thing to say when we're talking about osteoarthritis, there are certain joints more affected than others. So the knee joint is the most common joint affected. The hip joint and the hands would be the typical joints affected. Now, that's not to say it doesn't occur in other joints. People will report uh, arthritic symptoms in their feet. Um, They will report, you know, back pain that can be associated with some arthritic changes as well. So when we're talking about, you know, people developing developing it and one person getting it and not the other, really it's looking at the risk factors that may be um, more general risk factors or they may even be specific to that joint. So if I just run through some of the risk factors sure. fairly quickly. So I've already mentioned age is, is a risk factor. Genetics is also a risk factor, but it doesn't explain everything. But there is certainly a genetic component and studies have shown that perhaps 30 to 40 percent of the risk is due to genetics. We also know that being overweight is a significant risk factor. Um, and this is um I suppose a lot of people would think, well, yeah, that would make sense because you've got increased load on the joints, for example, the hip or the knee Mm. joint. But actually, we see um, increased weight being a risk factor for even our hands and our hands are not weight bearing joints. Mm. So part of that risk is, yes, it's due to, to loading, increased load, particularly over years. But also when people have increased weight, we have fat cells and those fat cells release little kind of inflammatory chemicals and they can contribute to the um, 
to the, the, I suppose, the pathology of osteoarthritis. Even though I said osteoarthritis isn't an inflammatory arthritis, we do see a very low grade inflammation. It's not a significant feature of the of the presentation. So increased weight is a risk factor. And as an example, for every five kilogram of increase in weight, you're increasing your risk by 36 percent. So that's quite significant. Mm. Then we have other risk factors that are associated with different types of osteoarthritis. So, for example, we do have a little subtype of osteoarthritis, um, which we often call post-traumatic arthritis, particularly occurring in the knee joint that is associated with a significant knee injury in the past. And many of your listeners will be familiar with anterior cruciate ligament injuries. We've heard Mm -hmm. this with lots of famous soccer players and GAA players. And this is a really important ligament in the knee that provides a lot of stability in the knee. So when an a sports person, usually of kind of a high level twisting, fast, accelerating sport like our soccer, even skiing, um, GAA, when they tear that ACL, you're increasing your risk of osteoarthritis later on, um, even in the next 10 years. So you could have a 25 year old, a 30 year old who tears their ACL. And right now, the research would suggest that even 10 years later, a proportion of them are at higher risk of getting osteoarthritis. I suppose being active also is a risk in terms of we have almost like an extreme of of, um, activity being risk. So studies have shown that people who are at a very high level of physical activity, really we're talking about elite level athletes. Again, Mm. Again, a good example is the professional footballer playing you know, six days a week over a career does have an increased risk of um, osteoarthritis in their knees, for example. But if you take the recreational type of athlete and a lot of people would ask about things like running, for example, the risk is not um, any greater. In fact, that probably reduces your risk and we can talk about that later. But on the other end of the scale, being physically inactive also increases your risk. So people often describe this kind of a U-shaped curve where we have the peak being at really high levels, like that 90% of the people won't be at, versus really low levels, which unfortunately a lot of people do have low levels of physical activity. And that low level of physical activity increases your risk. And it also increases your risk possibly by also increasing weight. So again, we're kind of back to the yeah. increased weight. So let's go back to now the early signs and symptoms that a person might experience um, when they are developing osteoarthritis. Can you tell us what those are um, and also the steps that someone can take to manage and, and prevent its progression? Yeah, and I think that is such an important thing. We really need to think about preventing arthritis and what we do through our life can can get to that. We don't have to wait for arthritis to appear for people to start taking measures. And again, I think we'll probably touch on that later when we talk about being active uh, and and undertaking exercise. So uh, I suppose the early signs will be some kind of an ache, like an ache type of a pain in a joint. Uh, And this may be noticed with very particular activities related to that joint. So, for example, for somebody with hand osteoarthritis, they would notice that when they're maybe gripping things, lifting heavy items, and they would notice that the hands feel achy and feel stiff. You know, they don't have that mobility there as well. Um, And again, for things like the hip and knee, we would notice it. uh, People would notice it with um, activities that would just, you know, there would be a bit more load on the knee. So, for example, going up and down hills, if people were hill walking, uh, going up and down stairs, maybe walking long distances, they might start to notice it, uh, whereas maybe shorter walks, it would be fine. So perhaps the duration of an activity, they might start to notice it. Or if they were doing a lot of, again, coming back to sports, maybe twisting, turning, they might just mm. start to notice it then. So that would often start with a kind of an ache it wouldn't really persist. It would be there. Um, it would stop fairly quickly after the activity stops. So it's very much what we call an activity related pain initially. And then they would also notice that stiffness, particularly after long periods of not moving. So typically overnight in bed, not moving very much. They get up in the morning and they will have a stiffness. But we often use time as a differentiation between osteoarthritis and inflammatory arthritis. So an inflammatory arthritis where we have a lot of swelling in the joints tends to be associated with a a morning stiffness of 30 minutes or more, whereas uh, an osteoarthritis, that stiffness would settle very quickly. Once a person gets up and moves, um, that, that stiffness would 
be gone maybe within 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. But if they were to sit, for example, if you were on a long flight, if you were on a train journey and you weren't get up and mo- getting up and moving, you would notice being a little bit stiff in, initially, but then it eases out quickly. So they would be the early signs. Um, and, you know, for example, pain at night wouldn't be a major feature early on. Pain at rest wouldn't be a, mer- a, a major feature early on. It would be- very much be that kind of um based on certain movements, positions and particularly being in in sustained positions over periods of time and then getting out of those positions. And just in terms of what steps somebody can take to manage it and prevent its progression. Yeah, well, we know that movement is good. You know, we Mm. we probably all have heard the idea of movement is medicine. And the way to think of our joints is that we have a fluid in the joints called synovial fluid. And this is like a lubricant. This literally keeps our joints nice and mobile. You know, uh, for example, if somebody if somebody is put into a cast after a fracture and a joint is immobilized, they they know what it's like when they come out of that cast. The joint is really stiff. They've been in that cast for maybe six weeks and the, the joint can be very, very stiff. So think of think of how important movement is. So that's where we need to move really through our lives and we need to get to develop good movement habits. And so for people who are starting to notice those early signs, I suppose the tendency may be to start to back off doing things. And in fact, I would almost say the reverse. They probably need to be a bit more vigilant about being move, about moving, about getting out of positions, you know, more frequently. So we do have this, you know, um, advice now about, you know, sit less, move more, you know, Unfortunately, our lifestyles now are forcing us into these sustained mm. positions. You know, people sitting down watching Netflix from yeah. hours and hours just jumping. I've heard, I've heard it referred to as sitting as the new smoking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, we're forced into these uh, positions where life is just making us more sedentary. So people do have to make very conscious decisions to get out of these positions, even for a few minutes, just get out, move, change position. Um, So that's one very simple thing people can do. But it's also about just getting a habit of being active, about about moving and also maybe doing very specific types of exercise that might help to protect you against developing further problems down the line as, as um, as we do get older. And of course, our main focus today is the role of exercise um, in managing osteoarthritis. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, why exercise plays such an important role in the first line treatment of osteoarthritis? Yes. So I suppose we talk about exercise. We've lots of different types of exercise. But um, I mean, exercise really is a very is when we're doing some kind of structured activity. It could be movement. It could be strengthening. It could be just aerobic exercise. So. Uh, we, we certainly have a lot of research evidence now that shows that exercise is considered to be that first line treatment. It's actually the first thing people should be doing um, when they have um, osteoarthritis. And, you know, when studies have compared exercise, for example, to drugs, it's been shown that it has, you know, a much better effect than taking a paracetamol. So we know that exercise can reduce the pain. It can allow people to do everyday activities better, can allow them to walk better, to get out of a chair, to you know use their hands better with hand osteoarthritis. So it can have very specific effects on the joint, which is what we want. And we want the muscles to be stronger around a joint to support the joint. But also we have the general effects of exercise. And I think, you know, these are hopefully becoming a lot more um, aware now. Maybe people are be made a lot more aware of the important benefits of exercise. So we know that exercise, for example, can reduce your risk of heart disease. It can improve our brain health, so it can improve our our kind of thinking functions. It can improve our mood. We know that exercise is a treatment now for depressive symptoms and for anxiety, which a lot of people Mm. with osteoarthritis can have. We know that exercise can reduce the risk of um, certain types of cancer. So, for example, um, breast cancer and um, prostate cancer risk can be lowered. So we have these really body wide effects of exercise. So and I suppose a lot of people would maybe say, well, what's the difference between physical activity and exercise? And really mm. exercise is just a more structured form of physical activity. So even when we're talking about exercise, we could really consider just being physically active in that So we have these very specific effects on the joint, but then we have more general effects that can target lots of body systems. And if we come back again to that 
problem of increased weight as a risk factor. By doing exercise, you're you're having an effect on heart health and diabetes. And actually, a lot of these conditions are all linked by um, increased weight, by obesity. So we, we do have these common paths that tend to affect these conditions. So so moving on, are there you know, specific types of exercise that are more beneficial for osteoarthritis? So I'll probably run through the different types of exercise first because there is honestly so much out there. It can be a little bit overwhelming for somebody to figure out. But broadly speaking, we can put exercise into maybe about three or four categories. So first of all, we have that aerobic exercise, that that heart and lung exercise. So any kind of exercise where you're just getting your heart rate up, you're feeling a little bit out of breath. And of course, you can you can increase that level of um, activity. People would often talk about light, moderate and vigorous levels of exercise. Um, so, for example, a kind of a slow paced walk would be light, a kind of faster paced walk would be moderate. And then you can go into more vigorous through things like running. OK, mm. so that's our cardiovascular exercise, our aerobic exercise, heart and lung exercise. Um, and that's a very important um Ex- a part of our physical activity that really people should be doing nearly most days of the week. So then we have strengthening exercise. So strengthening is where we're really trying to strengthen the muscles around a joint to support a joint because muscles play a really important role in supporting joints. So, for example, around our knee joint, we would have muscles like the quadriceps muscle, the hamstrings muscles. Around our hip joints, we would have the gluteal muscles as really important muscles around the hip and, um, you know, our hip flexor muscles. And then we would have um, in, in around the hands, we have all these little muscles in the hand and in the forearm that play an important role in, in giving us grip strength. So muscle strengthening is another type of exercise. That's something that doesn't need to be done daily. We would often recommend that uh, and even physical activity guidelines recommend that strengthening is really two to three days a week. Then we have mobility exercises. So these are exercises that improve our flexibility, that keep our joints nice and mobile and supple. And this can be simple stretches. It can be even things like yoga, tai chi. They're all really nice examples Mm. of um, mobility exercises. And then I suppose we have other exercises that might actually do all three at the same time. You know, we can have kind of like combination type of exercises. For example, um, you know, certain types of yoga, there would be some strength, there would be some mobility. You know, we also have some balance work in there that would also, um, you know, help us to reduce our risk of falls. Mm. So to come back to your question about uh, which is the best type, currently, really, the evidence would suggest that no one type is better than another. So ideally, people can do anything and we'll come back to kind of what, what, would, what would be advice, for, you know, in general about what to do and what not to do. But um, I would suggest trying to do a little bit of everything, actually. I think Mm. it's just good for our body systems. You know, have a little bit of aerobic because you'll get the heart and lung um, effect if you do a little bit of strengthening. And that doesn't mean you're going into a gym and and lifting big heavy weights. We can do simple strengthening with body weight. And again, that will very specifically target our our joint and our strength, particularly as we get older. You know, we definitely need muscle strength. We lose muscle mass as we get older. We Mm. all do. That that is a natural part of ageing. So um, certainly keeping muscle strength will help and that will also help even in terms of um, it'll improve our balance and our and our control and reduce risk of falls as well. And then our mobility, again, we all get a little bit stiffer as we get older. It's not doesn't necessarily mean it's arthritis. So keeping that that flexibility in our joints is also um, I would consider to be a kind of an important thing to do even again a couple Mm. of days a week. So um, so let's talk about someone, you know, who's currently living with osteoarthritis, you know, hasn't partaken in any physical activity for some time. Um, where would you suggest they, they start? Um, you know, for example, do you think it's better to try to exercise, you know, with a partner, a friend or, you know, do something that you find fun? Like what, what where, where does somebody start? Yeah, yeah, we definitely know again from lots of lots of research where we've people have gone out and asked people with arthritis what stops you getting mm. going or what helps you in getting going. So we certainly know now the things that, that will help people. And there's probably a multi, multi multi-pronged approach, really. So firstly, yes, I would say it is good to have uh, peer support, to have somebody to do it with you. You know, we're heading um, into the winter now. 
So in the winter months, you know, it can be really hard to go out and exercise. So, it, you know, making an arrangement to meet somebody and do something uh, outdoors, for example, will, will just be so much easier when you've committed with somebody else. And you'll get that, that nice peer support and it can be more of a social thing as well. So doing it with friends or family is one thing. I think as well, setting a realistic goal. I always find it really interesting in January. <laughs> you see all these people who you know, join a gym and they're mm. all going home and they go into the gym and they're going to be there for the first few weeks. And then by the end of January, <laughs> they've all disappeared. Mm. And that's probably just because they've just not set a realistic goal. You know, I think it's easier to start small st- and stay realistic about what's possible rather than try to set these really big. Or else they've set a goal and they've no idea how they're going to achieve the goals. Exactly. They haven't broken it down into steps. Exactly. And that that's that's exactly it. So mm. in that goal setting, you're setting a very achievable goal. You're not setting this big, long ranging goal that really doesn't seem like you're ever going to get there. And when you are setting a goal, it's probably not realistic to say, oh, I'm going to, you know, aim to be pain free, for example, because, you know, it may not happen. You know, mm. people people with arthritis aren't always pain free, but what they can do is they can manage the pain and they can live their life, you know, e- with the pain and and c- keep it under control. So and when you're trying to, you know, set goals about how much to do again, that idea of, oh, well, let's I'll stop when I get the pain. That's also, I don't think, a very realistic goal. Mm. So you are better to um, set a time based uh, goal or maybe a distance based goal if you were, for example, walking or if it was time based. I'm going to start with, you know, five minutes um, day one and then, you know, increase up and maybe increasing up that idea of kind of 10 percent is often a good a good rule of thumb when you're trying to particularly increase your aerobic capacity. But it's all about consistency and it's all about habit. And, you know, the analogy I would often use is if you think about brushing our teeth, you know, from a young age, we were taught we had to brush our teeth twice a day. It's just what you Mm -hmm. do to keep your dental health and prevent having all these problems with your with your teeth and your gums and your mouth. And really, we should be taking the same approach to our joint health. And it should become a habit. It's all about it becoming a habit. And it's just part of your normal every day. So if it's just not possible to, you know, commit to doing a particular type of exercise, then we can just try to be a bit more active in the day. And again, there are really simple ways to do that. So, for example, if you were getting the bus into town or going somewhere on a bus, get off one stop earlier than you normally would Mm. and just walk the rest of the way. When you're in a shopping centre, instead of going up the um, escalator or the lift, go up the stairs. Uh, So you could be out doing your gardening, you could be doing your household activities. These are all examples of just being movement and moving and being active. So there are ways of just looking at your day and seeing where you can try and and fit movement and activity in, even if it's not structured exercise. So the other thing is, I suppose, is the is the devices that people have now. We're becoming a, a technology driven world and certainly they play a role. There are people who will find those beneficial. They will have their Apple Watch, they will have their Fitbit, they will have an app on the phone. And by monitoring and recording their exercise or their physical activity, it will keep them motivated. And some of these watches literally tell you to move. Yes, mine does. (laughs) (laughs) But that's brilliant, you know, because we sometimes just do get engrossed. Mm. I mean, I'm the same. No, it's helpful. It's It's really helpful. Like I could be sitting, you know, for Mm. long periods of time when I'm working and I get totally engrossed Mm. in it. And I think, oh, God, I need to move. And when I do move, I mean, I do feel a bit stiff when I get going out of a chair. So it helps me to just remember to get up and move. So they play a role as well. They're not for everybody, but certainly I think they will also play a role. And I suppose maybe the most important thing is you have to pick something that you are going to enjoy. I mean, you know, I I really feel disappointed when people say, oh, I just find exercise is such a chore. And I can yeah. just hear that kind of uh, fatigue in their in their voice about not enjoying it. And I really think they just maybe haven't found found the right exercise. There's yeah. something out there for mm. everybody. And whether and maybe that's when you sign up to do something with a friend and a buddy and then it's mm. a social thing, maybe that'll make it easier. But it has to be something you say, OK, I'm going to do this long term. I'm not going to just do it for three or four weeks. I'm going to continue this. You know, I almost can see this as continuing lifelong. I yeah, mean, it's such a good point. Yeah. 
like I'm future proofing my life because I, you know, I took up swimming. And when I started swimming, I said, OK, I know that this is something I can continue to do well into mm. old age. Um, and that, that for me is a really big incentive to continue to do that because I know that that's it's just such a great way to move, um, you know, and to kind of keep keep your fitness levels and to keep your mobility. So that's that works for me. And I'm sure there's lots of other things people will say, actually, you know, I find this is really great. There is something for everybody. OK, thanks for that, Helen. And we're going to move on now to that big issue of fatigue and arthritis. And it's something that, you know, certainly people with arthritis often tell me that's nearly worse than the pain, the fatigue. Um, how, what tips can you give for somebody who's really perhaps, you know, experiencing um, sleepless nights because of, of their pain? It's feeding into this whole pain fatigue cycle and they just don't have the motivation to, to start exercising. Where, what can you recommend in terms of where somebody might start? Yeah, and I think sleep and fatigue may not feature as much in osteoarthritis as in some of the inflammatory arthritis. Yeah. Certainly it doesn't seem to be as spoken about as much, but it is definitely there. And, you know, again, research would show that and patients will say that, you know, I'm, I'm not sleeping, particularly as the disease progresses. Progresses, yes. So as as a person progresses and, um, you know, they're, they are getting worse and not all patients get worse. I think that's another really important thing to say. People say, oh, I'm inevitably going to get worse. They don't. But there is a group who, who possibly will progress and then the sleep at night will become affected and then they will have this fatigue. So, look, there's a lot out there about this concept of sleep hygiene. I mean, I'm not an expert in it, mm. but people can find information uh, uh, online about how to have just good sleeping habits. I mean, you know, I mean, the most basic thing is is the phone or the device in bed at night and, you know, having that on and not having that kind of quiet time before you go to sleep, you know, and that kind of blue light idea. Uh, So there is lots of tips out there on sleep hygiene and just managing your sleep environment and the, 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 you know, the the temperature of the room Mm. and so on. So that's and even the the run up to going to bed in terms of caffeine, you know, all of those, all of those things, not staying away from those things before you several hours before you go to bed if sleep is an issue. Yeah, exactly. And of course, the reason why sleep is an issue is because people have pain and then most likely it's because of a particular position they lie in in bed and certain positions will work and certain positions will aggravate their pain. So sometimes it is just about trying to find the a position that works best. But of course, you know, it, our natural instinct is to move during night. We can't stay in the one position. Um, but I suppose trying to manage all of those elements before you go to bed and when when you're in bed certainly will play a role. The fatigue part of it is, um, I suppose, related to the sleep, but it's also related just to the condition itself, you know, and people will describe the fatigue of arthritis being different to a, a tiredness that we might feel if we don't have a good night's sleep. So research has also shown that actually your fatigue is helped by exercise and that's really counterintuitive for people that if I if I go and exercise I am going to feel better and and I will feel less fatigued and it's almost like people need to just try it mm. <laughs> and see it and um, so we know that exercise has an effect for example on our brain okay and we get the release of uh, endorphins. We get the release of chemicals in the brain. People would often call them these feel good hormones, these feel good chemicals that are released from our brain. And so you get this, like it's serotonin is an important one. You get this really um, important feel good factor from exercise. And so that so that that can also then present as kind of feeling better, feeling less fatigued, feeling a bit energized. Um, after exercise, I suppose for practically for somebody to start again, it's just, you know, start with a little bit, just start with a few minutes, do something small because something small is better than nothing. And once you start, you know, you've started and, you know, you, then you want to just try and gradually progress that. So even if it was just doing a few exercises to, to, for mobility, just to kind of do some nice mobility work mm. for, for whatever joints are a problem, or even just general body mobility. So they, I think, are quite nice exercises or things to start with, just doing some nice, simple mobility exercise, you know, moving your joints, moving your hips, moving your knees. Um, I mean, that's why things like yoga can help. Now, not everyone likes yoga. Some yoga is very strenuous, but variations of it. There's lots of variations Mm. out there. I mean, the um, I suppose a lot of people would 
um, would say that exercise and water is really helpful. And that's not always practical for people because you need a pool perhaps in the vicinity. Uh, some people aren't just comfortable being in the water, but certainly even starting in the water can be good because the water does have an effect in terms of just, I suppose, reducing load, but also, um, you know, if there's if there's a temperature in the water, it can just feel nice and relaxing mm, if it's mm. not um, if it's a nice, comfortable heat, not too hot. And just on that, in terms of exercising in water, because sometimes I think people feel, well, oh, gosh, I you know, I can't really exercise in water because I'm not a great swimmer. You know, my technique's not great. But can you just talk to us a little bit about because you don't, you know, my sense is that you don't have to be a great swimmer. The exercise in water can take different forms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You don't even have to swim in the water. OK, you can go into a pool and you can walk up and down um, mm. in the water. And we know that walking in the water, for example, you often see people, you know, when they're injured ru- runners running in the water when yes. they can't run on land. And that yeah. just tells you that it's just much easier to do in water. So um, you can walk up and down in the water. You can um, do aqua aerobics. You know, a lot of gyms and pools will run aqua aerobics and they're not, you know, people kind of get a bit terrified when they hear the word aerobics <laughs> because of, <laughs> you know, our the tradition of doing these very vigorous um, aerobic uh, type of programs. But it's not it's not like that uh, at all. They can be very gentle. Again, you're just moving in the water. They're usually in a group. There's a nice kind of camaraderie uh, there as well. And, you know, it's to music and that just is a bit of a distractor and just mm. helps people to keep a rhythm. Um, and there's a routine there. So, you know, aqua aerobics, walking in the water, I mean, I think COVID in Ireland definitely taught us one thing. It taught us that we have this amazing sea all around us. (laughs) <laughs> and again, not everyone lives by the sea, but, you know, sea swimming became a thing and it continued to be a thing, which I think is fantastic. And getting into the sea just has lots of benefits. And I know in the middle of winter, it's not the most exciting thing. So maybe think about starting it in the summer. That's what a lot of people do. A lot of people start yeah, getting yeah. in, you know, when you go down to these sea, uh, sea uh, seaside resorts and, you know, people say, oh, I'm just going in from the dip. You know, yeah. they're not swimming. Yeah, they're not swimming. They're just dipping. They're yeah. just yeah. dipping, yeah. but they're moving in the water and they come out and they feel amazing. And a lot of patients will tell you that that is also really good. You know, it's just the effect of the water, the effect even of the colder water. I mean, you know, maybe the middle of the winter isn't the time to start that. (laughs) But certainly, you know, start in the summer when it's beautiful and then you could people will find it easier to continue into the winter. So, yeah, so there is there's options there. uh, Water is one option. Mm. And um, and otherwise, you know, again, something you you enjoy doing and even just doing uh, it for a smaller period of time. I mean, people with osteoarthritis will get setbacks. You know, they will have flare ups. They will have periods when their when their pain is worse, you know, than other times. There could be lots of reasons for that. And again, we would advise you don't stop exercise then. You don't say, oh, I'm just going to stop doing it. All you're going to do is you're just going to back off. You're just going to do less maybe than you would normally do. You're just going to modify it. Maybe don't go for um, the walk as long as you would, but definitely keep movement going. The worst thing to do is to stop, abandon it, and then trying to get that motivation to get going again is going to be harder. Yeah, no, I think that's really important advice. In terms of time, time of the day, is there, you know, is there a particular time of the day that's better morning or afternoon in terms of exercising? Uh, I think this is a bit personal for people, Mm. really. I mean, we do have uh, people who are just better in the morning. Um, You know, the larks, people are often Mm. called the larks and they just function better in the morning Mm. and they just get up early and they just want to get at the day and everything is just working a bit better for them in the morning. Um, And then we have people who would be the late night people, the owls. Okay, so that's a lot of that is perhaps, you know, related to our body clocks. And there's a, Mm. a big link between our body clocks and between and osteoarthritis, actually. And we also know that exercise can influence our body clocks. So I don't think um, it really matters, to be honest, you know, for the person who's going to do exercise. I think what's most important is that they pick a time when they feel it suits them. So some people might feel actually the morning isn't great. You know, I am a bit stiffer. I am a bit sore. And then for others, they might say, actually, because I'm stiff and sore in the morning, if I do my exercise, I'm actually going to feel better. And then we also have to fit it around our lives. You know, we have to fit it around what's going on in our lives. So 
I don't think there's a perfect time or perfect um, answer to this. I, I really would go back to the person and say, well, look, at what works for you? Mm. What would you prefer? And, you know, if you are going to do some level of activity, I mean, the other thing you can do is you can break it up. You know, you don't mm. have to do everything in one go. And this is another way to start easy when people say, oh, no, I can't go off and do my, you know, the physical activity guidelines recommend 30 minutes, five days a week. So about 150 minutes a week. So that might be quite daunting for people to say, oh, no, I, I don't think I could walk for 30 minutes. Well, then just break it up and do 10 minutes in the morning, do 10 minutes middle of the day yeah. and then do 10 minutes in the evening. And if 10 minutes three times a day still isn't achievable, well, then do five minutes. You know, just start somewhere because mm. as soon as you start somewhere and then you just use that 10 percent rule, then you can just start to gradually increase um, that activity level. I think that's a really important point because I think, you know, the National Physical Activity Guidelines came in a few years ago and there was a sort of thing about 150 minutes in the week. And for some people with arthritis, you know, they're just ne they're not there at the moment. They're, they're not even close to that. Mm. So I think what, what you just said really encourages people to get started and, you know, work towards that. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to be at it to start off with. That's it. That's it. I think people think, oh, I've got to hit that that number. Yeah. And it's just a number. Or it's <laughs> a no I won't be able to hit it. So therefore, I'm not going to bother that's at all. It. So yeah. that's <laughs> yeah. one of the difficulties. Yeah. And little is better than none. You know, like something is better than nothing. The other thing that you mentioned, I mean, I'm, most of our, our discussion today has been about the role of exercise. But, you know, the other side of that coin is weight management, diet, etc. Um, and I know that's not your area of expertise. But can you tell us a little bit, you know, just in terms of the role that that plays along with exercise? Yeah, well, it does. It, it plays an essential role. And um, I've already mentioned that increased risk with increased body weight. So it does increase your risk of arthritis. So certainly diet and weight management then becomes a very important uh, first line treatment. And when you mentioned exercise being a first line treatment, it's not the only one. So weight management is the other first line treatment and also um, self-management and education. So a person being informed about, you know, kind of things to do and things not to do, which is, I suppose, part of the purpose of this podcast. So in terms of diet, I mean, again, you know, dietitians are going to advise about about diet and about healthy diet and nutritious diet and so on. But what we do know is that a certain percentage of loss of body weight does have a very big impact. And the, the studies show that five to 10 percent loss of body weight can reduce pain and improve function by about 30 to 50 percent. So that's very that's, substantial. It is. It is. Now, 10 percent loss is better than 5 percent loss. But a bit like mm. our exercise, 5 percent loss is better than nothing. So so that's the you know, that's really where the evidence is at. So ideally, diet and exercise should be done together, particularly if somebody is not at that ideal weight, really that kind of within the normal mm. health uh, weight range. What we also know is that diet on its own does not help. So it really does need to be a combination of diet and exercise to to get those effects. I mean, for people who don't have weight problems, that's fine. You know, probably healthy diet is still going to be important. But certainly then we still we still come back to the exercise being that first line treatment. And just my final question for you today, um, just in terms of what would be your top tip for somebody? when it comes to their osteoarthritis and exercise? Well, do something <laughs> would be my first tip. I mean, I think what you've said earlier is, is just kind of bang on, you know, that idea of, oh, you know, uh, I've got to get to this magic number. I've got to do this amount or I've got to mm. do a certain type of a program. And that's just not achievable. So there are lots of resources out there as well for people that if they can't, if they're really struggling to get started. So, for example, Arthritis Ireland, we know, has some amazing resources. Mm. We know the self-management program covers exercise mm -hmm. and getting started. We have the Be Active with Arthritis program, and that's a supervised program with the chartered physiotherapist that patients can sign up to. And that might be enough to just get them into that exercise habit. I mean, we have brilliant resources on Healthy Ireland. So this is a health service um, initiative, you know, uh, in Ireland. And there's a website, Healthy Ireland, and that has a lot of supports there. And I think there's a lot that out in the community if, if people go looking for it. I think mm. there's a lot of 
activities and resources out in the community. Now, sometimes somebody may, it just may not be, a, they may not be able to do that on their own initially, right? It just might be just too overwhelming mm-hmm. when they start looking for information, start looking for resources. And I suppose we do also know that supervised exercise does get the best effect. In other words, if people do exercise under the supervision of a health professional, such as a physiotherapist who who would do a lot of exercise prescription for patients, then they will get the best effect. So if you were really struggling, didn't know where to start, needed to set goals, needed some specific advice about what are the types of exercises I should be doing or what type of even what kind of activity I should be doing, then you know, seeking out a health professional and getting that initial kickstart yeah. um, would, would also be a suggestion. So that, that would probably be a few of my tips. Yeah. Thank you so much, Helen. And thank you for your time today. That was Not really all. informative. Not at all. Delighted to be here, Brian. Thank Thanks you. very much. That's all from this episode of Inflammation Nation. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or as they always say, wherever you get your podcasts. For further information about arthritis, you can visit our website, arthritisireland.ie, or contact our helpline on 0818 252 846. See you next time. Inflammation Nation is supported by Pfizer.